Where do these screen dances end up if not on YouTube, Vimeo, or at academic conferences? The hybrid form of dance for camera or screen dance has emerged since the 60s, largely with the advent and proliferation of portable video cameras. Dancing bodies are no longer restricted to the sound stage and can be tracked by the camera in any site, recontextualized by each site, or placed along green screen or, or alongside text, music, and treated with an endless array of effects. My works have been screened at dance on camera festivals that have in turn proliferated all over the world. Occasionally, my works make it into the experimental short category of a legit film festival. The Snowy Owl here, inspired by a poem of Ben Landry, was accepted last May into the Cannes Film Festival's Court Métrage, or Short Film Corner. It was one of a three or so dance films among hundreds of narrative fiction and animation shorts. Notice how the way we view or take in narrative and read the body on the screen can be drastically altered and perhaps even dictated by the inclusion of text on the screen. I tried my best to replicate on screen the arrangement of Ben's text as it appears on the page, but then had to make certain choices as to the weight, flow, timing, and spacing of the text relative to the moving body and visual effects. There is much to consider when comparing the act of making the body visible for the screen versus for the stage. These next clips demonstrate a practice I've been playing with for the past decade or so that gives vi visibility to both at once in juxtaposition or counterpoint. For performances of first my own dance company and then our university dance company, I've created layers or surfaces of video as front and or backdrops with which the dancers perform live. Oftentimes, the live figure appears along with its own image on the screen, distorted by effects or radical alteration of sight, scale, and number. The use of video drop continues a long tradition of theatrical scenic painting and set design, but puts it in motion, challenging me to choreograph the video landscapes into the very fabric of the danced movement, and vice versa. Beginning with Seven Enigmas in 97 and continuing over the next decade with Aerial Web, The Dawson Variations, Patient Spider, Body Talk, Peninsula, and The End of Shame, I overlaid large-scale video projections with live performances and vice versa. Here in Door to the River, 2010, four dancers are dwarfed by cylinders of water filmed while peering down from the walking bridge over Barton Dam. And video then also allows you this monument monumentality of scale of the distortion of proportion score by Eric Santos, uh, one of our composers in our school. Forest Through the Trees, a few years later, takes its visual and narrative cues from Gertrude Stein and her Cubist contemporaries, fragmenting movement gesture in tandem with text from Stein's The Making of Americans, while also fracturing a painting by Georges Braque into shards of moving components against which the ensemble does battle. And earlier this month, I montaged a 70s defense civil preparedness agency film with video footage of members of our percussion ensemble playing Michael Gordon's Timber for Big Weather, and I stationed a cast of 15 dancers between two layers of the projected imagery. With my love of triptychs, I seized an opportunity in 2012 to move from two to three transparencies of video. I had been fascinated with kinetic counterpoint and how the viewer's depth perception was a key element to the visual experience of kinesthetic empathy. There was also something about the sheer pleasure of 3D, of breaking through the single flat plane into a constellation of differentials and variables involving scale, proportion, and the impactful forces of directional motion. These forces could drastically alter the reception of the picture within the frame at any moment and either pull the viewer in towards intensified engagement or push him away and back into himself. I knew this would not induce the same sen sensation of total immersion as VR or virtual reality with its cumbersome headsets and million dollar production budgets, but something more akin to a walk-through blow-up of, of the transparencies in my dad's old medical books or of subjects of the same or contrasting realities or parallel universes. I remember my aha moment as a 19-year-old 
lying back on a grassy slope on a summer night in northern Michigan and gazing up at the stars. Suddenly, the constellations accordioned out from connect the dots diagrams of mythological characters on a single black plane to a celestial scaffolding holding up beacons at different light years away, some closer, some further. A feeling of expansiveness, of having been sold a story that was no longer viable, of existing in relationship to a vastness I had not previously understood, hit me simultaneously between the eyes and in my chest cavity. So with the black void of the sky as my model, I began to imagine a similar shared field constructed on a more human scale, within which I could float or plant moving figures at varying depths. It is interesting to note that perspectival rendering based on a single vanishing point in the depth axis of a picture originated in the art of the Greco-Roman world, but first by scenographers and stage designers, and only later passing into panel and wall painting. Clonal renderings plays with this idea of drawing or rendering imagery in a void, which dancers do in their ephemeral transitory medium, hoping only to create impactful pictures in motion and leave behind indelible traces. With three scrims placed seven feet apart, each scrim acting as a projection screen for its own short throw projector, I'm able to emulate architectural renderings in space and compose a moving architecture in time by replicating myself, not unlike the sorcerer's apprentice and his mops, to assist me in charting out the void. For my sabbatical a year ago, I was granted funds and a most generous gift of free space from David Cantor at the North Campus Research Complex to create and house the pop-up projection pavilion. Robert Adams, associate professor in our Taubman School of Architecture and Urban Planning, designed and constructed for me an elegant and efficient structure with which I can indulge in my newfound obsession with depth perception and kinetic counterpoint. Since its completion in August of 2014, I've been able to create numerous studies and finished pieces that could only exist on the pup. I have so far activated only the three equidistantly hung parallel screens of the five total. I'm eager over the coming year to complete equipping the pup so I can compose action across all five screens, either linearly and sequentially, as with the horizontal unfurling of scenes of a Chinese scroll, or as extended panoramas or kinetic frescoes of simultaneous juxtaposed and or interacting events. Beginning with simple improvisational studies exploring the, the push-pull effect towards and away from camera, I asked 30 dancers to take their turn being videotaped against green screen in our video studio. This study of U of M dance alum and now adjunct faculty member Sean Hoskins strikes me as a lead-in to the essential endeavor I will now try to describe and leave with you as the closing part of this lecture demonstration. I quote the painter and teacher Hans Hoffmann, quote, depth in a pictorial sense is not created by the arrangement of objects one after another towards a vanishing point in the sense of Renaissance perspective, but on the contrary, and in absolute denial of the doctrine, by the creation of forces in the sense of push and pull, end quote. Here, Hoffman was referring specifically to the manipulation of color in scale and juxtaposition on a flat canvas. The perceptual action of color optically registered by the viewer as advancing or receding. I am borrowing from Hoffman to highlight the depth created by perceptual and visceral action of figure as it navigates between receding or advancing planes or frames, as if in a magnetic field of enacting forces, in a kind of force field of depth, re-embodying the verbs push and pull. A moving body exerts its own force in the impulses, shifts, and thrusts, its own inner will, its self-motivation. But it also does so within a constellation of forces, interacting with that field of forces around it. The figure is indivisible from the landscape. These forces are inseparable on stage or on single screen. But the pup allows me to separate out both the fields and their figures into three transparencies, particularly when I float the figure in a black void. Their arrangement, counterpoint, illusion of weight and flow between screens become the poetics. It's as close to the modernist ideal of abstraction as I've been able to achieve, since human movement inherently betrays its multiple sources, or as Martha Graham often quoted of her physician father, quote, movement never lies, end quote. 
but by removing the spatial context or setting, I am at least able to isolate the figure and highlight its inherent properties and the creative choices that define its poetics. In this case, I lined up the three one-minute improvisations on the same axis, forwards and back. These are two of our lovely former students. For more formal, wor formal works that move beyond the etude form, I drew from past work and also shot new footage specifically for the pup. I was able to accordion out works like Patient Spider and Paris Triptychs onto the three screens. In doing so, they preserved their formal integrity while entering the realm of participatory spectacle, causing viewers to almost impulsively shift from stationary position to gain multiple vantage points or to actually move around in between the screens. And you'll be able to do this Wednesday through Friday, noon till six this week. The, one of the byproducts of Robert's structure here was the spill of imagery on the floor. And if the floor was white, it would act as an, yet another screen. Uh, I shot this footage in the room overlooking the Seine while I was at the Cité Internationale. A, a shaft of vertical light came through the curtain and struck a wall. And of course, you know, being the dancer I am, I took my clothes off and I started making the, the light move with my back and with my body, knowing that I could use that in a, in a more kind of painterly fashion and treat it so that I could even attempt to make the body um, unrecognizable, kind of into pure form. And then, of course, using the... Uh, multiple screens, I could, I could have uh, entire planes of motion receding or progressing forward to create this kind of visual bellows or breathing thing. Final Cut Pro is interesting. I, I put a point at the beginning of the color I wanted and then at the end of the sequence of another color and they, it did the rest. So I, I can't take credit for all of that. Technology. I left the confines of video studio and navigated across campus to find interesting locations such as the century-old ROTC building which, has, which had been recently emptied and condemned for demolition. Something very uncanny happened. I had to get permission from the, the plant person at the campus. I had to go through all sorts of offices. I've done a lot of subversive activity while here. I guess I can say that now that I'm a dup. But um, I came up the central stairwell, and there was, believe it or not, one officer's uniform in a plastic bag hanging over the banister. I looked at it. I took it out. I put it on, and it fit me perfectly. So this is an improvisation being possessed by a military uniform. <laughs> and it's the closest thing I'll ever come to being in the military. <laughs> it's sad that that beautiful building's gone. I always wanted it. And I ventured to northern Michigan to the site of my annual late summer painter's retreat to create solitaire. So I'm going to talk over this, some ideas. In the end, and I'm not quite sure what this has to do with my quest to make the body both visible and believable via dynamic performance, provoking an enhanced sense of depth, but I'm left with the nagging doubt, the sneaking suspicion, the dangerous proposition bordering on what one might call aesthetic hedonism. Is this all about the pursuit of pleasure? I'm not the first to question, think Hume, Mill, Collingwood, many others who have all chimed in regarding the production and reception of visual art, music, and drama, but conspicuous in its absence, not much about dance and the body. So as the dance improviser, director, and editor, I will ask, is my work about articulating and sharing pleasure, making something to show of it and giving it with the unadorned human body as instrument, as mobile canvas, as both puppet and puppeteer? 
the more refined and textured, complex and multifaceted, or dynamically and convincingly executed, the deeper the pleasure? And is there another pleasure in the subversion of pleasure by those artists who intentionally deconstruct, distort, or defy cultural norms of the body's beauty and pleasure? And is this pleasure or anti-pleasure shaped and curated for stage or screen for appreciation by an elite audience groomed in a set of shared etiquettes and cultural, historical, or aesthetic biases? Or dare we consider such a thing as universal appreciation for or pleasure taken from what Rudy Arnheim called the coherent melody of motion? Dare we call it a kind of natural or practiced grace with which the dancer wins us over, rivets us to the screen or stage, and like a skilled actor, makes a let's pretend proposition an authentic experience? Climbing a bit further out on a limb, I think of both the ancient Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu and the French philosopher and Christian mystic Simone Weil in their pairing of gravity and grace. A practical and grounded Taoism meets the most austere and ascetic Christian spiritual practice by integrating gravity and grace in exquisite dynamic balance. Imagine our choreographic endeavors for stage and screen then as making a kind of visual and visceral music with our bodies as we negotiate gravity a force that both weighs us down to earth and our physical limitations and provides a fluid medium within which we learn to navigate, to make sense of our world, and even to find ecstatic engagement in the pleasure of movement. Perhaps the video screen provides its own specific equation of gravity and grace by framing and floating the moving body in its digital medium. Perhaps the screen releases me from the double bind and seeming futility of my dumb show theory that my contemporary dancer's body attempts a nonverbal communication while defying narrative gesticulation or any literal enacting of a story. Is meaning making via the dancing body projected onto screen really about registering a specific gravity? In this case, not the ratio between the body's density and the reference substance of water, but of the substance of the negative space containing the digitized figure and contained and magnified by the screen and its frame? Does this specific gravity and grace of body on screen provide the medium or catalyst for a deeper, more thought-provoking pleasure that registers at multiple levels? Does it activate the particular pleasure of the voyeuristic gaze, the power of the spectator over the scene, as often cited in the study of cinema and television? Add to this the pleasure of empathic recognition or kinesthetic empathy, of compositional form accruing over time into a cohesive and or cathartic whole, of movement as metaphor, as indirect reference or evocation by suggestion or symbol, of the satisfaction of getting it or of the piece working and making its own visceral and visual sense, of the critical thinking it generates and the games of theoretical or conceptual one-upsmanship we are often expected to play in academia? Is there pleasure in the exquisite balance and interplay of the visual and the visceral, of effect and affect, feeling and form, practice and theory, the pedestrian or mundane and the virtuosic or the extraordinary, gravity and grace? Or can we move beyond dualisms and the mythologies of modernism and postmodernism to constellations of interacting forces, to multiplicities in multiple dimensions? Pardon my flights of fancy. I'm afraid I've become lost in my own words. So let me wrap this up. Like so many theorists, I may suppose and suppose various frames for considering what is meaningful in contemporary art making. But in the meantime, I am compelled to make art, to make the body visible in a manner that the viewer believes what she sees, almost despite herself. I acknowledge that simply by placing the body or bodies within a frame, I direct the viewer's focus while accepting responsibility for every relational dynamic that happens within that frame. 
I seek to engage the viewer both visually and viscerally on screen or screens in a way that rivals or transforms the experience of live performance, playing with enhanced depth perception and kinetic counterpoint. I also shamelessly steal every trick in the book, every feat of kinesthetic empathy, every skill gleaned from decades of crafting and performing dances for the frame of the stage, all put into motion by my sincere desire to please, a desire in direct balance with the pleasure I find as a dancer in moving and making movement visible. I invite you to return tomorrow through Friday, noon till 6, to view at your leisure a selection of works created specifically for the pup. Hopefully, you will find pleasure, perhaps wonder, perhaps some deeply personal moment of meaning-making in viewing framed moving pictures of the body in motion, even if regardless of my intention. An unruly and risky proposition at an institution largely built upon text-based knowledge and academic or scientific research. But not so, I believe, for a 21st century university that recognizes and appreciates, indeed values, diverse forms of knowledge and the necessity for creative work and play in every kind of learning and discovery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now I've got to turn this off. The thing will just keep looping, looping forever if I don't shut it off. See back there? There you go. Well, all, all I can say is wow. I mean, wow. <laughs> um, Peter has very kindly agreed to take questions, so um, we'll turn the floor over to all of you. Thanks for sitting through that with me. Uh, the provost's office made sure I edited that down. I'd had like at least an hour and a half, and so I could go on and on. Get a dancer talking. Watch out. Any questions? Yes. Sorry. So, you know, to the lay person, the movement of dance is intrinsically tied with the music. And yet, as you add the, the added complexity of the visual on the screen, does the, does the auditory part of the music become more or less important? Well, you know, it's interesting, and we talk about this in dance composition class endlessly. Does dance have to be linked to or motivated by music? And so I often have the students working in silence. Uh, Twyla Tharp, many other dancers have created works in silence or, or to one score and then switched out another score. So, I mean, you have Mark Morris who does a kind of a one-to-one -one realization or musical visualization. Uh, in this case, I think I pretty much follow what I've always done making dances for the stage. Sometimes a, a musical score will, ins will inspire me, and other times I'll just chart out movement materials, commission a score if I'm lucky, or find music that, that seems to work well. And I think every choreographer and every filmmaker has a different way of doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've been going to the Ann Arbor Film Festival since its beginning, and I've seen over the years some great uh, dance films with Ed M. Schwiller and Ellen Nikolai as a team and uh, Pas de Dieu, where he yes. had the multiple frames and everything. And, Norman Claren. Uh, Andy Warhol with the Velvet Underground doing some live with projection. And this I find really remarkable, especially your multi-screen. This is really fantastic. I didn't realize you were such a good filmmaker, if I may use that word. Thank you. And the point I make it often is that I find the making and editing of films just a direct extension of my choreo choreographic practice. And I'm finding that as our students take the screen dance course with Terry and myself, they are, they're finding that as well. Is, uh, I, I find actually editing film on Final Cut Pro as the best, as I said, the best um, practice for editing dances on stage. <laughs> I mean, you have entrances, exits, cross dissolves, fade ins, fade outs. Um, where do you place the body within the rectangle? I mean, there is a kind of a tyranny of the rectangle here too. And so maybe, well, 
Robert Adams, my colleague, and I are, are hoping to devise yet another configuration of screens that allow for much more flexibility and mobility in terms of vantage point and, you know, scale. So, but yeah, the Ann Arbor Film Festival is great. You know, everything's been done before. I mean, I, I imagine that this has been done in somewhat similar configuration at trade shows. I mean, you know, wherever the money is, this has happened already. But um, it's certainly been a first for me, and um, I'm hoping to, to continue working with it. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. You know, I, I remember you performed wonderful. Wonderful f performance you did with uh, Philip Glass to the, uh, the screen in um, Rackham. Do I remember correctly? You, actually, that was Andy Mead's score. Yeah. Oh. And, and it was... Um, it was Ariel Webb, I think, if that's what you're speaking of. I think so. And Jonathan Timon was on stage with me, simultaneously filming me with it being projected onto the screen of Rackham. Right. And then we had six dancers in this space live simulcast onto the walls of Rackham. Yeah, yeah that was in 2000. That was in the Dark Ages. <laughs> yeah. Bill. 30 years uh, ago when you arrived, and we arrived, Jessica Fogel, um, you would improvise to a Chopin Nocturne, I believe, and you would record it. You would record yourself, you reacting, making choices with that music. And then you would go back and learn what you did, and then you would set it on dancers, uh, in sections, and of course you performed the solo, and you would use these theme and variation operations as an editor, as a choreographer. And um, um, actually Peter and I took a, a Final Cut Pro workshop together, and a week-long intensive. I uh, was daunted by it, overly so. Peter hung in there. <laughs> well, Bill, you know it's interesting because I was talking to Jeff about this, being self-taught and kind of renegade, I, I find things that others don't find. I find my own way, but I'm way behind on the technology. Um, it's like I don't know how to... I know how to drive a car, and that's it. I know nothing else about a car. Uh, but no, I'm glad you brought that up, Bill, because uh, something that video has allowed me to do, not only to make this kind of presentation, but it has um, provided me a visual memory, where, as Bill says, I, I long ago began experimenting with what, 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 what would be the difference of the movement that I generated spontaneously in a kind of an altered state, captured by the camera, and then learning that improvised movement versus going through the very labor-intensive process of choreographing work where, okay, I'm gonna put my right foot in front and then I'm gonna take my right foot forward, my right hand forward slightly and then I'm gonna dip my head down. What did I just do? Now let's uh, accumulate more. If I do that, then, then I'm gonna turn and then come back. I mean, choreographic, the choreographic process is kind of labor-intensive, but we're blessed with these extraordinary body memories. And so uh, what improvisation allows me to do is to, to I think, reveal uh, different, more spontaneous edges of my body that happen in the moment where choices are being made at a different rate with a different kind of impulse and uh, immediacy. And so my, some of my students are here and know that I often challenge them to learn Video from videotapes of my own improvisation, and I'm always I always marvel at what they come back with, and I'm I and I then I look at what they're doing and I don't recognize it as my movement, and I have to figure out what I'm seeing. It's a kind of a bizarre moment, but I love it. A few more questions, and then yeah, Liz. So Peter, having known you for many years, I'm, I'm really fascinated by your creative process. And I wondered if you could speak to that. You, you draw from so many different disciplines. You draw from so many different people. I see painting, art, architecture, music, poetry. And I just wondered if you, if you could say a few things about what has meant to do your work in this setting uh, of the university. 
Um, well, I came to the university because I needed space. And I, I was kind of, uh, New York became too expensive, too, too difficult to find space, and a dancer needs space. Um, so that was number one. That allowed me to flourish and make works and then to have students to work on and my faculty colleagues to make works with. Um, then I inherited a dance company in Ann Arbor, um, which became Peter Sparling Dance Company, which was kind of a satellite off to the side. Um, but I think what the university has offered me, and it's why one big reason why I came here is that I, I wanted to raid the silos of other disciplines. I wanted to just cross borders. I, mean, I was desperate to hear poetry readings and to, to watch films and to go to lectures. Um, it, you know, when, you, when you're raised in the conservatory model from Interlochen to Juilliard, was touring all over the world, dance companies, had my own dance company. I, there was a lot of stuff that I missed of all the interests I had in the visual arts and poetry, et cetera. So coming to the university, I knew I could find that. And um, also, uh, people who believed in what I did and allowed me the space for play, such as at the Life Sciences Institute at the NCRC. Uh, so that's been invaluable. Um, the creative process, it's so scary. I, you know, from one, what's going to keep you up tonight? You know, it's, what are you going to remember the next day? Should you write this down or will you forget it? Um, it's, um, but I'm finding also that the way things work these days for creative artists, we have to plot things out over long timelines because everything becomes a project. Everything has a budget. Everything has to do ha, involves fundraising, involves personnel. So the creative process becomes a kind of an entrepreneurial effort and a collaboration with many different players. So it's no longer uh, being isolated in one's ivory tower or in the, in the studio, although I think that's why I was drawn to painting, is I could isolate myself and do it all myself. I, I was needing that. So I hope that answers your question partly. Yeah, Ralph. We can, we can do one more question. Peter, I have two responses, uh, comment really I'd like to make in those two forms and then invite if you care to a comment from you. For the material which I see on the screen, the images which I see on the screen, I, I myself have two responses. One is satisfaction, deep interest in the forms which are there. There's something of the elegiac sense of, nostal of, of loss, uh, of a sense that if I'm paying attention here, I can't pay equal attention to the second screen, the third screen. I can't imagine what's going to happen to me with five screens. <laughs> so that there's a combination of, of satisfaction, but through the sense of, of evanescence, uh, a really elegiac sense uh, of form disappearing, of, of images going without my having more than a split second to respond to them. It's a little like life that way. But uh, this pushes and pushes and pushes to the edge of the capacity of the mind to, to hold it, is to take Box Goldberg variations and press them and press them and press them into complexity. So if evanescence was in some ways form and evanescence, the theme of this, the paintings seem to insist, on the other hand, on holding on to materiality and a sort of brutalist presentation of, of the body. If I see these in a raking light, I see the layers of paint, I can infer them even now. Which brings me to a comment on you, potentially, caught between a sense of evanescence and the, the, the sorrow which can come with that, with an almost desperate attempt through material to keep it still present. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, and that, that probably answers Liz's question as well. 
A lot is born out of desperation to cling or to hold on to something, to give it life before it disappears. Uh, and you're absolutely right, Ralph. That's very eloquent, and I'm flattered that you would say these things. Um, these paintings do come from a place where I'm, um, I don't know if the word's desperate, but there's an urgency to get it down, to put it into form. And, and I'm still not used to being able to return to my studio the next day and to look at what I did the day before, I, to walk in and see it up there. I mean, I've always envied visual artists for that as a dancer. And it's probably because as a dancer with an aging body, I do, ha I do have that sense of longing and, and elegy, elegiac, yeah. And I, I don't often step back and decide, well, okay, of my six works, five are really sad. I mean, I don't, I don't do that, but if I were to look at it, that pr there would probably be this deep kind of longing, aria-like thing. Yeah, but thank you. Well, thank you all very much for coming and sharing this with me. And come back if you want to, Wednesday through Friday. Thanks. And thank you, Provost Pollock. Folks, there's a reception out, out yonder, too. <laughs> <laughs>